how do you restore the effects of feudalism when you could never go back to them? No one's going to take a knight in modern days seriously. Monarchy is at this point is just celebrity. It's it, it, nobody takes it seriously as a real institution. Um, so what you have now is really either some kind of republicanism or democracy or tyranny. Join the best in the movement. It's conservative conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Marlo Slayback and Tom Sarouf. We're joined today by one of our favorite professors at ISI, Dr. Khalil Habib, who's an associate professor of politics at Hillsdale College, where he teaches political philosophy and American political thought. Dr. Habib has co-edited two books, The Soul of Statesmanship, Shakespeare on Nature, Virtue, and Political Wisdom, and Cosmopolitanism in the Age of Globalization, Citizens Without States. He is also, and I know this personally, a really good guitar player. So hi, Dr. Habib. Thanks for being on with us. Well, thanks for having me. Let's stop now since that intro is going to be all downhill after this. So. <laughs> Well, before we begin the conversation, I'd like to thank you, um, listener, for listening to Conserve Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and our mission is Educating for Liberty. So if you'd like to join us in fulfilling this mission, be sure to rate and review this podcast wherever you get your podcasts, and um, that'll help us reach more listeners like yourself. So before I ask my first question, I actually just realized, like, this is probably the first podcast to be recorded where we have three people of Middle Eastern descent heritage. So that's a fun, uh, a fun realization I just had. Um, but uh, I want to um, more interestingly ask about your upcoming book, Dr. Habib. So it's on ancient Rome and political philosophy. And, um, you know, I know Polybius is a big part of that, a significant part of that. And he's someone who doesn't get enough um, attention in classical political philosophy, as you were telling us um, before we started this podcast. So or before we started this episode recording. So if you could tell us a little bit about the book, um, about Polybius, and what makes him interesting to you as a thinker, especially given the context uh, that you were just explaining to us, and perhaps you can frame the conversation surrounding that for, for a listener who might not be familiar. Um, the book started off, like many of my projects, pursuing one question, and then as you get down into the weeds, you end up moving on to other questions, and then more rabbit holes. So the original question was, how did Montesquieu and Machiavelli understand the rise and fall of Rome's greatness? Because any country, especially like ours, that reaches an age of empire, you have to start getting worried about some of the uh, the causes that lead to decline and some of the dangers of empire. And so it was really motivated by trying to understand the current era in which the United States is functioning. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, it has reached, it's no longer a small republic, obviously. And at this point, it's an empire, and could we learn anything from ancient Rome about the dangers, the perils, and the promises of empire? So I started really just examining Machiavelli's discourses on Livy, uh, in which he examines the rise and fall of Rome, and uh, and then I wanted to study Montesquieu's book on Rome and compare the two. But it became very obvious that as I was doing that, that you really needed to understand the ancient uh, sources that they were drawing upon, and sometimes in many ways actually distorting. So I went to the most obvious, and that was Livy, and uh, prompted by Machiavelli's discourses on the first 10 books of Livy. But then when I got to Livy, it was obvious that uh, he had other sources that were influencing him as well. So it just kept kept seeming like I was going back further and further back. And then I finally arrived at Polybius. So Polybius is really the beginning of this book. And I wanted to examine um, what contributions did he make to understanding Rome? And then what did Livy take from him? And as I did that, a picture emerged that I wasn't quite expecting. It was, surprised me. And that is that um, the ancient sources that examined Rome, like Livy and Polybius, always emphasized the religious component of Rome to the point where if you're reading Livy, you would almost confuse ancient Rome for a theocracy. Um, now, that's not to say it's modeled after Iran or something like that. But religion was so central that you couldn't understand any battle, any any progress or regress in Roman history and military and political affairs without recognizing the central role of religion. So I was really struck by that. And Polybius makes similar comments, especially in Book 6, where he's famous for describing the cycle of regimes. So what started off as a book just looking at uh, Machiavelli and Montesquieu and their emphasis on Roman institutions – suddenly this really sharp contrast began to emerge that Montesquieu and Machiavelli aren't as interested in the religious component. They seem to make the institutions do far more 
heavy lifting. And in Montesquieu's case, the science and technology and progress of Rome seems to come to the foreground. And so suddenly a tale of two Romes emerged, that the ancient Roman Republic was really fated to conquer the world as an empire because of its religious uh, core. You would never see that in Machiavelli or in Montesquieu. So that was really surprising. And so I felt I had to expand the book. And so it became a book about basically two ancient thinkers on Rome and two modern thinkers. But there's one other key feature. Along the way, um, I started teaching Lucretius's On the Nature of Things. And he was, of course, discovered or rediscovered uh, sometime around the Renaissance. And he had a massive influence on Montesquieu and Machiavelli. One of the things I noticed there is that Lucretius is also obviously interested in Rome. But he's an atheist. That's, there's nothing controversial about that. And he's a materialist. There's nothing controversial about that either. What's interesting about him is he, he wants to move Roman politics away from religion and the fear of the gods and to move it closer to Epicurean philosophy, which is a philosophy of atheism grounded in materialism. And once you see him as a turning point in Roman intellectual thought, you'll suddenly see that Machiavelli and Montesquieu are actually building on Lucretius. They're attempting to found a political science on Epicurean grounds, which is really novel because Epicurean and, and Lucretius doesn't have a political science to speak of. He defines liberty as a tranquility of the spirit. And he thinks that you can achieve this kind of tranquility and liberty provided you're free from religious persecution. Uh, prejudices, and that you have a certain kind of philosophic disposition. And the way that I see Machiavelli and Montesquieu contributing to this is that you can't achieve that kind of tranquility or liberty without political institutions that stabilize politics. And so they build political institutions on Epicurean grounds. And so the, sorry to give you such a long-winded answer, but what started off as just a simple little attempt to understand Machiavelli and Montesquieu spiraled into this long book and, uh, and that's basically the main theme, you know, that, um, that you hit a point in Roman history where suddenly, you know, you can't really go back to the gods as they were understood by the pagans, of course. And then you have philosophers who were in interested uh, and, and, and uh, embraced in many ways Epicurean uh, foundations. I mean, Montesquieu talks about the nature of things throughout his work. He references uh, Lucretius all over the place. And so it's an interesting... I'm, interesting uh, investigation. So I'm, I'm basically done. I just have to write the introduction and the conclusion. That sounds very fascinating. There are, I mean, so many, I guess, different ways we could take the conversation, but I mean, something I'm familiar with that you mentioned was the chapter six of Polybius, the, this idea of the cycle of regimes. And I want to connect it to what you said about how Rome was destined in a way to become an empire, because that's not, at least in that part, um, where he's talking about the cycle of regimes. He doesn't mention, I guess, the regime in the relation to, I guess, uh, a city-state or, like, a, I guess, we in the modern parlance, we call it a nation-state. But the, between that and an empire, which has, you know, colonial or imperialist holdings, but there you could, there's almost a cyclical progression throughout history that you could see Athens, obviously Rome, Britain, the Ottomans, the Holy Roman Empire, the Habsburgs, arguably America today as an empire. Um, but I was, I'm wondering if there's anything in political philosophy or if Polybius has something to say on, or what Polybius has to say on the transformation from a republic to an empire and to maybe tie things into the modern day, this argument over what America is. Is America an empire as well or where are we in that typology? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, Polybius never gets into Rome as an empire. He limits his study to 220 to 146 BC, and that's when Rome is essentially a republic. And in that cycle of regime that you're referring to, it's book six. And it's not simply a cycle of regimes, which is what a lot of people take him to, to, to be doing. One of the things that I explore in my book is the religious role. I mean, he talks about customs, not just simply institutions. And also, they didn't understand institutions in the same way that we do today, where you say, look, there's clearly the judicial branch or there's the executive branch. Uh, institution or constitution literally means like I'm looking at Tom's constitution, which you're made of. What are the parts? And, you know, you can't sever your arm from your body like you can a separation of power, so to speak. So part of the institutions that Polybius focuses on are the religious customs that encouraged and promoted um, a, a love of virtue and a love of piety. 
And uh, what makes Livy interesting is Livy's the one who traces Rome to its imperial uh, stage. And it is Livy who essentially says that Rome was fated. Uh, they, they almost had a divine mandate to conquer and to become an empire. And uh, Machiavelli picks up on that and thinks that to your specific question, is there a political theorist who thinks about, you know, whether or not empires inevitable from a republic? It's Machiavelli. Machiavelli essentially argues that empire is absolutely inevitable, but not because of divine mandates, as you can imagine. He's, he's going to give you a secular or naturalistic or material explanation as to why that's necessary. And in the discourses on Livy, uh, what he does is he first examines um, human nature. And once he adduces that it is acquisitive by nature, that there is no teleological end to our desire, like there is in Polybius or in Aristotle. Aristotle and Polybius recognize that human beings are acquisitive, but their teleological end is moral virtue, and that is to, to, to moderate man's desires and to subordinate them to reason. And uh, But with Machiavelli, there is no teleological universe. It's just man's infinite and insatiable desire to acquire. Well, if that's true, then the only regime that would suit human nature would be an acquisition, a, a, a regime that acquires well, there's only one that can do that successfully, and that is a republic. There are dangers when a monarchy does it, Machiavelli points out. Oligarchies are, uh, have a trouble doing that. There was something about Rome that enabled it to acquire and to grow. The other side of the inevitability of the growth of a republic to an empire, according to Machiavelli, is national security. Part of the problem is if you remain small, you're always going to be subject to the whims of your neighbors or any belligerent enemy. And so the other, the other aspect of, of Rome's necessary growth, and from Machiavelli's perspective, any good republic is bound to grow into an empire, is the inevitable necessity to expand the influence of your security as much as possible so that you can secure uh, your territory. That's why people like Montesquieu are interested in questions about a confederated republic. How do you maintain some degree of republicanism in an in a understanding of politics that requires extensive growth. Um, and, that's, and that's where Machiavelli and Montesquieu um, are on the same page. So and what about America? In what sense? Uh, I guess we were founded as a republic. Right. It sounds like Polybius. I know Montesquieu is very important to the founders. Right. Um, well, I mean, as, the as the Federalists say, I mean, the Anti-Federalists thought that there was a possibility to maintain something like an ancient republic. And one of the insights that the Federalists have, and I think they're correct, is that ancient republics were so small that you couldn't find an original co a colony small enough to even resemble an ancient republic. So that is over. That train has left the station as far as the, the Federalists are concerned. Even in the first Federalist paper, there's a whole question of whether or not we're going to become the most interesting empire in the world. Um, they were they took uh, Roman names on uh, the size and already of what they wanted to ratify in terms of territory was already significantly larger than anything resembling an ancient republic. And the Federalists tell us that they've discovered a new political science, that they're doing something entirely new, that there's a danger, in fact, of founding an, on an ancient republic that and, and by ancient republic, they mean something like what the anti-Federalists claim to be putting forward something small, something that direct democracy, something that was largely homogenous. Um, the problem is that they tell you, for especially, in, for, for example, Federalist 9, that any time you look at ancient republics, they're always at war. They're perpetually moving from civil war to tyranny. You know, you need a Napoleon to come in and clamp down. And, and, and this was just the problem of ancient republics. They learned that from Thucydides. They learned that from Machiavelli. They learned that from their study of history. So the only way you can actually uh, have modern politics in an age where you have empire, you've got the English, you've got the Spanish, you've got maritime powers abroad and in your backyard, is to simply adopt a policy where you are large enough, you have a confederated republic that can influence its, its own immediate sphere and space and protect itself from any kind of foreign or domestic trouble. Um to put into the context of the, uh, I guess, the 
a regime change that our listeners are probably very familiar with um, and one that our students recently became probably very familiar with by participating in a seminar ISI actually led with um, Professor Habib in um, Austin on the American French Revolution. So students got to read Burke and Tocqueville. Um, and in the Tocqueville assignment, you assigned uh, the Ancien Regime and the French Revolution. Um, and Tom was saying that and also my colleague Jane, who was at the seminar, um, they were particularly struck by Tocqueville's argument that the death of the Ancien Regime was almost inevitable um, because the death of feudalism and the proliferation of trade radically transformed uh, transformed the mores of the states of pre-revolutionary France. So they also mentioned that the students were also very struck by your assessment. Um, and I, I would love to talk more about and perhaps get your sense of, as especially as the right rethinks what it means to have a humane economy, um, it, it seems like their free trade, although it has, um, you know, improved, vastly improved across across the world, living standards. Um, there's also, you know, the, the right has stood for deregulation, creating jobs and wealth and all of these these different um, historically the the position has shifted until today where there are more there's more of a I would say a, a schism happening <laughs> on the right. But how would you make sense of these competing perspectives and priorities on economics, um, especially, you know, speaking contextually and drawing from from these readings, which we'll link in the uh, show notes for anyone who's interested? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, again, I go back to the Federalist and actually Adam Smith. There's a misunderstanding about what a free market is and what the American founders consensus about economics versus politics was. Mm -hmm. And um, if you read the Federalist papers, you don't even need to get out of the first 10. They are uh, very much uh, suspicious of Montesquieu's claim that free markets and commerce simply soften mores. And the spirit of the law, as Montesquieu talks about, the, uh, the great effects of commerce. It loosens mores, which is to say it makes you a little bit more degenerate and soft, but you're not as warlike uh, because you're going to think more in terms of economic exchange and you'll tolerate other people's views. And it also, uh, for the sake of commercial exchange and, and, and money interest, but also um, in that context of the spirit of the laws, he thinks that it will also uh, soften the warlike, the spirited, uh, the spirited nature in, in human beings. Now, the Federalists completely reject that. Uh, they actually say in one of the early Federalist papers that, you know, be careful of those who claim that commerce somehow is going to soften mores and lead to a reduction in war. It's just the opposite. What happens is, especially in a modern era, there are many wars that are fought for financial reasons, for oil, for resources, for what, what have you. Nothing has changed. Machiavelli would agree with them that uh, man doesn't need much of a pretense to go to war. Um, and the idea that commerce can somehow uh, serve as some kind of panacea for security is extremely dangerous. So the American founders were never uh, simply free traders like you often hear today, where the only thing that's real is the market. And national and political interest is just sort of an epiphenomenon of the past that holds back material progress. Uh, Adam Smith, for example, uh, is all in favor of tariffs. If tariffs necessitate a certain kind of uh, – if, if national interest necessitates them, then so be it. And what he's essentially saying is there are limits to just simply free economic trade, and those limits are set by the standard of national interest. Um, it's only recent, especially in the rise of libertarianism and anarcho-capitalism, that there's an idea that the only thing that's real is a market and everything else is a figment of one's imagination. And um, I would say that uh, Machiavelli, Montesquieu, I'm sorry, not Montesquieu, but certainly Adam Smith and the founders would reject that. So you can have um, economic interests. You can have uh, prosperity, uh, but you have to do it with a statesman's eye. You can't just simply be indiscriminate. Trade. I'll give you an example. If free trade is all there is, then why doesn't Israel trade with Iran and, and, and enrich Iran? Well, well, the obvious answer is, well, by enriching an enemy who wants to destroy you, you're sowing the seeds of your own destruction. So obviously, a free market isn't how a statesman would simply judge policy. Many factors have to play play into it, not the, not the least of which is your own national interests and national security. Um, so, yeah, I don't see a conflict, you know, between economic prosperity and national interest. But uh, but that is at odds with uh, certainly a lot of uh, modern libertarians who, uh, like I said, think that free markets are essentially the answer to everything and free trade. Um, the other question you had was about Tocqueville and the inevitability of what was the, uh, the, the, the collapse of feudalism. Marla, was that was that the question? 
Um, yeah, so it was Tocqueville um, and the, yeah, I think it was the, is that what I said? The, yeah, yeah, the death I, of feudalism and the, yeah, and yeah, the proliferation of trade. The question, and if I, if I captured it correctly, let me know. Um, mm -hmm. In the Ancien Regime, a book that Tocqueville wrote about the French Revolution, he points out that the French Revolution was inevitable. And one of the reasons why it was inevitable was because France of all European countries had destroyed its feudalism before any other nation in Europe. But it didn't just simply do that. It centralized authority in the hands of a monarch. And so what you essentially had was a soft despotism. Soft because he wasn't ruling with an iron fist. He was essentially bribing the aristocracy who had always served as a buffer to centralization to essentially take titles without any political responsibility. All political action would be governed by Versailles, a sort of central government. The consequence of that is once the aristocrats, according to Tocqueville, abnegated all responsibility, their responsibility to their own serfs dwindled. And they used to be a political experience and political participation actually on the part even of the serfs in Europe. What happened once government centralized in France is that you had no longer an aristocracy or a lower class having any political experience. And so for Tocqueville, you were bound to have a revolution in abstract ideas because you no longer had a class anymore that had any political experience. So they were, they were vulnerable to fantastic abstract ideas of viva, you know, liberty and reason, completely divorced from reality because they lost contact with uh, political participation. That's why in Democracy in America, uh, he warns Americans uh, about ever losing uh, interest in local participation in forming civic associations that push back against any kind of centralized authority. We don't have a feudal system here. We, we started really sort of on a blank slate. Whereas with Europe, they had centuries of feudalism that at least taught many people that there needs to be some kind of check on centralization of government and feudalism served that sort of indirectly and by accident. It wasn't by design. It was by human action, but not design. It just so happened that was the political organization that ensued after the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, but Tocqueville's biggest concern really is um, how do you restore the effects of feudalism when you could never go back to them. No one's going to take a knight in modern days seriously. Monarchy is at this point is just celebrity. It's it, it, nobody takes it seriously as a real institution. Um, so what you have now is really either some kind of republicanism or democracy or tyranny as far as Tocqueville is concerned. So how then do you restructure or reassert local participation when you no longer have feudalism? You no longer have the three estates. You don't have a distinct church, a distinct aristocracy. And he believed that America held the promise for that. As, as a, He held up America to the French and pointed out that what made America so unique, unlike the French Revolution, is that it was founded by Christians, Christians with an English past uh, of civic and local participation. And he says these early American Puritans did something that no one in France ever dreamed was possible, and now was combining Christianity with liberty. In the French Revolution, the revolutionaries hated the church, hated its hierarchy. Uh, they wanted to destroy it as much as possible. They didn't like any kind of hierarchy. They were driven by this egalitarian utopia that they, you could have a world in which no one was politically uh, better off than anyone else. The danger with that is that for Tocqueville, America showed that you need Christianity and you need the idea of political participation to have the kind of freedom that is now the only one available in the modern world. Now, why Christianity? Like, why, why introduce that? Two reasons. He wanted to correct Europe's disdain for Christianity because of the Enlightenment, this idea that you could found on just sort of this Cartesian ego or individualism, and that would be enough to just be able to govern your life. And, uh, and he showed that that is absolutely impossible and will actually lead to tyranny because you would create a society of weak individuals uh, who, are, who would be too weak without a class or an estate to support them to stand up to any kind of governmental overreach. And you're seeing a lot of that today. Now, what Tocqueville saw in the Puritans and the Christians was because they were unfree in their morals, in other words, they could distinguish license from liberty, they already had the habits, therefore, of self-governing. They could govern their own desires. 
that was a prerequisite as far as Tocqueville was concerned for the next step, which is to govern your life. So if you can't govern your own appetites, you're not suited for liberty. And uh, so, and then Aaron Tocqueville believed that Christianity more than any other religion was the best religion uh, to equip human beings with the mores necessary for an era bereft of any kind of feudalism and with the potential tyranny of government and the tyranny of the majority on the horizon. And so he did everything he could to encourage faith in Catholicism. Uh, he believed also that uh, Catholicism, as long as it may remain true to its magisterium and didn't cave to the modern world, will always attract those in the modern world who are sick of just materialism or individualism or need some kind of order. They need some kind of hierarchy. They need a, a, a rich intellectual and religious tradition. And so he thought that uh, the future looked bright uh, for, for, for Catholics. Uh, he did like the, the role that Protestant religion played in educating the young females. He felt that it gave them a little more degree of freedom so that they had a sense of choosing their own husbands. They weren't cloistered like they were in France and under Catholicism. So he saw the pros and cons of each religion and wanted to encourage them as much as possible. I want to pick up on the thread and dive deeper into the French Revolution because over the weekend I saw the new Napoleon movie mm -hmm. um, and I thought it did a great job of capturing the sort of chaos and uh, almost like hilariousness of the French Revolution. Obviously many people died, but like it was so chaotic, it was almost funny. And it was, I think it was in a way mocking. I don't know whether that was intended or not, if the whole thing was just meant to be a little bit of a funny movie. But I was sort of, on a serious note, something that jumped out at me was like after the terror they depose robespierre um and then they have this committee but um sort of foreign affairs takes a role so in the movie uh napoleon leads the battle at toulon to take back the uh this fort and they basically kick the british out and at the end of the battle which is successful and everyone should go watch this movie the battle scenes are incredible but um, after this battle, all of the soldiers are, have their rifles up and they're going, long live the Republic, long live the Republic. And then five years later, once Napoleon has a coup and then installs himself as the emperor, everyone starts shouting, long live the emperor. And just, I just sort of jumped out at me, like, how do you go from being a nation that's saying, like, vive la France, down with the ancien regime, long live the Republic, and then five years later, you're shouting, long live the emperor. Cause like in America, that would have never happened. I mean, maybe I guess it would have, if Washington said I'm the King now people might have, might've gone along with it, but mm -hmm. sort of, I guess, how do you, yeah. How do you transition from, I guess, jealously guarding your liberties of the people and of democracy against a King to now being champions for another King? Yeah. I think what that shows you is that their instinct all along was for God. They wanted something that was transcendent. It's just that they were corrupted by the enlightenment and they were corrupted by the lack of any political experience that centralization robbed from them. Now, the reason why there had to be a Napoleon is for the same reason the Federalist warned us about ancient republics. The problem is uh, once you have chaos or anarchy, which is what ensued uh, during the, the, um, the French Revolution, you're going to need a strong hand to then reinforce order. It's the same thing you find in the Middle East. You go in and you're thinking you're going to have a regime change and you're going to have liberty just popping up everywhere. And, and once you give them the right to vote, who do they elect? <laughs> Religious people, they don't want a democracy. Uh, or they end up being once again falling back into despotism. Tocqueville's main point in that work is that if you don't have centuries of political habits and religious habits uh, to temper human the desire, you know, and to encourage self-rule, self-governance, you're always going to have a revolution that leads to, to anarchy that will then require a tyranny to restore order. And that's what happened in the French Revolution. I recently finished a book. Um, I, I think I've, we plugged it on the podcast before because it took me a while to read um, because it was like a thousand pages long and I have a child. So um, it was really informative of kind of there's these continental differences that like literally continental differences between the um, the Francophile Bolsheviks who certainly drew from, you know, the Paris Commune and the lessons of that failure, but also the successful French revolutionaries um, between their revolution and the French revolution. And um, I mean, the Russian revolution was 
hugely impactful for the 20th century and also even you know the 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 conservatives the, the neo conservatives and a lot of the progenitors of what we would think of as conservatism today um for that that ferment a lot of them were um at least you know influenced by trotsky in a past life um but something that kept coming up in the book is this um mention by a lot of the i think gorky was one of them so a lot of the like intelligentsia the russian intelligentsia commenting on how asiatic um russia was and um some of the the cultural elements of the war that or of the revolution that were almost scandalous to them. These people who otherwise were very, you know, they wanted to see the French revolution take place in Russia, but when it played out, it was, um, it was, it was much more almost barbaric was the language. A lot of these revolutionaries would use. And it was, it's something that I've been meaning to look more into is kind of, you know, what was perhaps the difference was, um, was it religion? Was it the, the fact that a lot of Russia was, it's a huge, vast continent with a lot of peasantry. Um, what would you say, and, you know, maybe drawing from your knowledge about the, the French revolutionaries and just everything from the geography to the cultural practices, the religion of, of France at that time in the 18th century, um, what about the the Russian Revolution? How have how should we you know especially as conservatives think of um, this revolution that didn't happen I guess too long ago comparatively speaking, but also um, what were the on the ground the, the setting um, in the late twenty eighteenth nineteenth century um, early twentieth century that made it so much more um, I mean it ended in a year you know a, a, almost a century of Soviet communism. So what went wrong? I guess I'm not a fan of the French Revolution either, but something clearly was much different about the Russian. Yeah, no, and there were actually very a lot of similarities. You know, first of all, that sounds like a great book. If you can remember the name, let me know. I'd love to read it. It's called A People's Tragedy by um, Orlando Figes, I think his last name is spelled. He's a British historian of Russian history. Okay, yeah. no, I'd love to take a look at it. You know, have you ever looked at uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace? He actually anticipates I just it. ordered it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're going to find a lot of your answers there, believe it or not, because one of the things that Tolstoy um, is reflecting on, and he's an enlightened thinker. And at the time, you know, before he become a, became a, a, an Orthodox Christian, at the time, he was heavily influenced by Rousseau. And he used to apparently carry a little pendant with a picture of Rousseau in it. It was his God. Now, why is that relevant? Rousseau was a counter revolution, uh, sorry, counter enlightenment revolutionary. And one of the things that Rousseau denied was one of the main premises of the Enlightenment. And that is the, the more you spread Enlightenment, the more you're purifying morals, and the more you're actually going to bring about freedom. Rousseau thought this was a naive picture of the Enlightenment and that it would actually lead to the opposite. It would lead to things like the French Revolution. And this is, I'm drawing on uh, Rousseau's first discourse. So one of the things that Tolstoy brings up in War and Peace is and he's fully aware, he mentions many of the philosophers, he mentions the European Enlightenment, and he fears he fears that Russia, like the French, are going to go jump in, all in on the French Revolution and not recognize that, like Burke did, that each people has a cultural inheritance that forms its character. Some people are capable of that kind of liberty and some are not. It would be like prematurely letting your child out of the house and drive. You know, they have no experience on the road. You don't, you don't want to hold them back. You want to see them flourish. But it has to be at the right time and for the right reason, with under the right super guidance as the guidance and what have you. And one of the things that Tolstoy points out is that the Russians tried to experiment with the alignment by the liberation of the serfs. The serfs in Russia were different from what the French had. If you read the, the Ancien Regime by Tocqueville, when the aristocracy and feudalism in France existed, there was no such thing as a serf without political experience. There were political duties and obligations on, on the part and uh, he digs into archives and shows that they were a very political class. They weren't just simply doormats for the aristocracy or something like that. They had real political participation. The Russians did not. So they had no experience of politics. So they began where the French end up, which is to say with no political experience whatsoever. And as soon as you have that, you have the, the inexperience of – imagine the inexperience of flying a plane and now you're in the cockpit. That's the difference between having political experience, flight time, flight hours, and not having any at all. And all you have is a book about how to fly a plane with no real contact hours. 
that's what happened with the French and with the Russians. Um, and when you don't have experience, you don't know how to check fanciful ideas. And so when you when you have these enlightenment ideas that now, you know, human beings can govern themselves autonomously. Well, th- we all know individuals can do that, but it depends on their age, their circumstances and their experience. And Tol- Tolstoy believed that the Russians were either only uh, going to find that kind of freedom under a monarch or some kind of emperor or just under despotism where they will find uh, just at least security and order, but not liberty. So he's very much like a Burke, very much like Rousseau, very much like Tocqueville, you know, let the French have their French Revolution, but the Russians should change and and correct on their own terms some of the abuses of politics and should not be embracing ideas that were incubated uh, in another part of the world. We're starting to come to a close, and we've hit on a lot of really important thinkers in the Western canon and sort of in the background has been Edmund Burke. And so I know you pay t- a lot of attention to Burke. You've taught for ISI students, uh, you know, Burke's reflections on the revolution and taken students through various passages and showed them what his sort of thinking was. Uh, I want to ask about Burke in America because a lot of ISI students will know that Burke is critical of the abstract rationalism of the philosophes. Um, but as a sort of, as a statesman, he ends up being a, uh, a defender or a defender or supporter of the American Revolution, uh, in spite of some Enlightenment influence in America. Um, but I, I guess a sort of a two part question is if you could explain a little bit more why um, Burke would find a cause to champion in a new country that claims for itself to be on the basis of the laws of nature and nature's God. Um, if you could dive in a little bit more on that. But then I guess there's a sense in which we've had, America's had a sort of French revolution. Um, it hasn't been as bloody or as, as violent, but like uh, a, a revolution in ideas from what the founding is to where we are now. Um, obviously, I think a lot of people would say that like the country's pretty unrecognizable, both politically, uh, you know, socioculturally. Um, but so A, why Burke would have championed America if it has similar uh, themes to the French Revolution, but then also what we need from Burke today, like what Burke could tell us about solving our problems today. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, it seems so incoherent on the surface that why would he condemn the French Revolution on the one hand and then support the American? In fact, Karl Marx believed that the only reason he did that was he must have been paid off by American sympathizers. I mean, he actually thought that. And many people, I think, just couldn't quite understand where Burke was coming from. I don't believe any of that played a role. If you look at a short uh, speech, the letter, or actually a letter, a letter to the sheriffs of Bristol, one in one of Burke's writings, um, he points out in, in that the reason why the American Revolution was justified was because England had a, become a tyranny. There was this view among the English that Parliament had such extreme and such total authority that to, to slight Parliament in any way was like going before an angry God, sinners before an angry God. And so what ended up happening was the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the sympathy, the, uh, the affection between the Americans and the English broke down. And as a result, England became a tyranny. I mean, Burke essentially accuses the English of tyrannical behavior, and he feels that no people should tolerate a tyranny. And so that the Americans were genuinely uh, justified in breaking with, uh, with England. He didn't think that uh, the the French were justified. He f- he felt that as a, as a, as a monarchy, there were still opportunities for the French to actually draw from their own tradition uh, certain reforms. And so he highlights in his reflections on the French Revolution um, how England did that at one point. You know that the glorious revolution was such a situation where there wasn't a complete break with the past. There was a mending of ways in the way that a weaver, you know, would find like a hole in your garment, wouldn't pull the whole thing apart, wouldn't start all over, but would just simply mend from what is there. The other thing, the other reason why he supported the American Revolution is that he also believed that the Americans were very different from the French. Uh, the Americans did have, um, they had political experience. He doesn't really talk about their abstract ideas. He doesn't talk about, you know, natural laws. You pointed out in the laws of nature and the laws of God and the, and the nature's God. What he's really looking there is trying to show sympathy with the with the Americans. That when England 
overreaches, when Parliament becomes the equivalent of an angry God before sinners who've slighted it, then then the real issue isn't so much condemning America as much as fixing what's wrong with, with England. And England needs to curb that appetite of tyranny. Um, and, uh, and that was Burke's real concern. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Now, as far as what we can learn from Burke, um, you know, Burke is excellent for a number of reasons. Uh, every thinker, I mean, regardless of where the positions are, has something to contribute. I think Burke's greatest contribution is the recognition that affection among citizens is crucial. It builds a political body that does uh, that creates a certain kind of harmony that isn't just simply relying on law coercion to bring about order. And um, and he speaks about the importance of traditions like chivalry, which for us is just comical and stupid. But for him, that really created a moral imagination that created a certain kind of uh, sympathy and uh, desire to uh, to help uh, to correct any desire to abuse power always help those who were in need. And he felt that there was a certain kind of moral imagination contained in certain traditions, uh, especially, like I said, in the, in the, in the, um, in the, 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 the tradition of chivalry that helped to reinforce affection. And I think in our age where uh, especially the left is so interested in creating conflicts over any conceivable difference, it literally goes against what Burke believed was the source of finding some kind of common ground among citizens. You don't want to, demonize and which is what the left does today and this is what was going on during the French Revolution uh, they wanted to and England did it England when Parliament became this absolute God so to speak it would strip Americans of any kind of dignity it even hired Germans to go out and kill Americans if they could find them and so that demoralizing of a human being stripping them of any kind of dignity paved the way for justifying terrible tortures and death on them. And so Burke is excellent because he shows you that when, when any segment of your population starts to do that, you're actually laying the foundation for stripping people of their rights and their security and right to exist. And we don't have that kind of rhetoric anymore. We don't have, we just simply assume it's party politics and it's just people trying to get ratings and it's just people trying to get attention. You know, it's far worse than that. Tocqueville really reminds you of the political necessity to restore some kind of civility through building affection for one's fellows. And we're living in a polarized age where we want to destroy any kind of affection because you've demonized uh, half the country as irredeemable or deplorable. And, and, and Burke would warn against such things. That, that, that lays the foundation for tyranny because if you really are living among evil people, then tyranny is justified in clamping down on them. And Burke feared that what happened to the English uh, uh, with respect to the Americans could potentially happen to England if it ended up taking on the manners of the French Revolution. So I think he was excellent for our day for that, to just draw attention on how important civility and affection are for a good, healthy political order. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Habib. That's a perfect note to end things on. I actually love the the prospect of doing like a lecture or something on chivalry, the moral imagination, um, because I, I think that's a term that I would love to unpack because it's, it's one that Kirk also really liked a lot and drew from Burke. Um, and uh, we've held events on the topic before uh, in the, con in the uh, context of art. So um, mm -hmm. I think the, the political imagination, as you mentioned, is also something that needs, um, you know, generationally honed. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, it's been a pleasure to have you. And um, if listeners want to read more of your stuff, perhaps pre-order your book um, when it comes out, follow you, where can they find you? Um, right now, I'm not, I'm not on social media, but they can find me on the Hillsdale Politics Department. Uh, there's a list of my, a, a very short list of things that I've published. Uh, the book isn't ready to go out yet. I'm still trying to wrap it up. I'm hoping to make more progress over the spring and definitely by the end of the summer. Um, but uh, I'm sure it will be listed on our faculty website. And, if, and my email is there if anybody has any questions or follow up some morning willing to uh, to engage in any kind of uh, back and forth as well. So it's an honor to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Habib. And also Thank for you. any students listening, Dr. Habib will also be um, lecturing and teaching at our honors conference, our premier student conference, um, which will take place um, in August of 2024. So if you're interested in applying, go into isi.org and you'll find an application there. Uh, those are due February 4th. So 
hope to see yours. And thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you've enjoyed this podcast, uh, please be sure to head over to isi.org slash resources to see all that we offer our members, including the intercollegiate review, select modern age articles, debates, seminars, lectures, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we'll see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.